Hello and welcome to the Be Glad movement. My name's Pollyanna and I'm on a mission to bring you as many stories as possible of good coming out of bad and reasons to be glad. And today I'm joined by Sarah and Sarah's got a really interesting story and she's actually just um, developed a special app for your phone but I won't tell you about that. I'll let Sarah tell you all about that. So hi Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi everybody, hi Pollyanna. Oh, hi, yeah. Um, I'm going to just let you dive straight in, tell us about your story, you know, where, where things began and how life changed for you. So over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I suppose if we go to the beginning or to the beginning of this particular section of life, um, I was 37. I'm 47 now. So this started 10 years ago or thereabouts, um, 37 years old and was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, at the time, I had a nine-year-old daughter. She's nearly 20 now. Um, uh, yeah, this month, in fact, this week. Um, so yeah, a nine-year-old daughter, and she uh, was at primary school, as you would expect, and I was working in a kind of corporate sales manager type job in the uh, legal sector, so selling into law firms. Um, and I was very much enjoyed my job, lived in a lovely little place called Stanford, which actually is where I still am. I've moved away and come back um, and had this diagnosis. And actually, it's worth saying, um, and I think people are more aware now than they used to be. But my diagnosis actually didn't come about because I found a lump. It came about because I found a dimple. So very similar to the dimple that you find in your cheek. Right. Um, I Yeah, I found a dimple. And it was one of those moments where... Um, out of the shower, as ladies will, will relate to this, out of the shower, head over, towel around your hair, stand up, and my arms are up, and I'm kind of got this towel on my head, and I just caught a glimpse in the mirror of a little dimple just on the underside on my, on my right side. Didn't think anything of it particularly, and then doing exactly the same manoeuvre some five or six months later, noticed the same dimple again, but it had got bigger. Right. Um, went to the doctors and doctor couldn't feel anything uh but very good doctor female doctor and not that that means that she was better particularly but it happened to be a female doctor and she just said look as it's got bigger and it's changed we'll send you um so they did and I wasn't expecting it to be anything simply because the doctor hadn't found anything and I hadn't found a lump and I couldn't find a lump and I think back then messaging and to some extent still today the messaging was very much if you find a lump go Right. And that's what you're looking for. And of course, it's not just lumps. It's any changes, anything like that. But I hadn't heard of the dimple thing before. Um, so went and got a diagnosis of a type 2 cancer, type 2 stage 2 cancer, which basically meant that it had just started to spread. Um, nothing, nothing drastic at that point. But of course, you don't know initially. So they do the biopsies and everything, send you away, invite you back in and say we have some choices to make. Um, and my cancer was hormone positive, which meant that as a young woman with cancer, because if you're under 40, you get called a young woman, which is great. That's kind of the upside of the, of the <laughs> whole thing, because you're not feeling very young at that point, but you fall into that category. Um, you have to choose what you're going to do. So um, dependent on where the cancer is and, and, and how far it's spread, they give you choices as to what sort of surgery you might, you might want to have. So I opted to have a partial mastectomy on my right side. Um, they took away quite a few of my lymph nodes because they were worried initially that it started to spread and it turned out that it hadn't got into my lymph nodes, which was great news. That's really yeah. positive news. Um, but I also had to have a, I either had to have five years worth of injections every month, solid X injections into my stomach to suppress my hormone production. Because again, as somebody at only 37, your hormone production at that point is still relatively strong. Right. And my cancer was hormone fed, so they needed to suppress that. So I also had a, what they call an ovarian ablation, so a partial hysterectomy to take my ovaries away which I think when telling this story, actually the cancer diagnosis, I was quite practical about. Um, and that will probably come through in lots of the things that I say. I think for me, and I know everybody's different, but I think for me, information is important. Mm. So 
I would do that thing that they tell you not to do, which is go home, go online and read lots, Google lots. Um, but for me, that was very useful because it allowed me to ask good questions. It allowed me to, dependent on the response I got back from my consultant, I knew what my next question should be and I knew what my risks were according to the information that they were giving me. So I think that that collation of information and that research actually allowed me an element of control. Okay. Um, and I'm not a big control freak, but actually, I think in that scenario, one of the things that's really difficult is you have no control. Sure. So you've just been given this piece of news and you had a plan. You know, you got up that morning and you had a plan of things you wanted to do and what you thought your next week would be, your next month would be, your next six months would be. And you lose that control over your day-to-day -day, your existence and all of the kind of normal stuff that exists in your world so when you get a diagnosis like that control is one of the things that disappears almost immediately so research and um and that kind of gathering of information was really helpful for me in that scenario so um i had that surgery um and about six months later i had the um ovarian um ablation surgery so i had the ovaries out um mm. and then i had daily radiotherapy for six weeks uh they let me off on sundays but six days a week um, at, at haddenbrooks in cambridge who are brilliant by the way if anybody gets a diagnosis and they get the opportunity to go to haddenbrooks it's an absolute center of excellence and i've been there twice now so we'll tell you about that in a minute but um so yeah really fabulous there and six weeks worth of radiotherapy um and actually i was very lucky in the the, the corporate job that i had at the time i say corporate but it was in the, in working selling into the kind of legal corporate sector right. the, 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 the people that i was working for i'd not been there very long um but i knew the md before i started working there and I worked from home. They were based down in Bristol. Um, and it was just at the beginning of the era where selling product online, so we were selling, as I say, selling into law firms. It, traditionally, you put your suit on, or not, in my case, because I didn't like the pinstripe thing very much, but you put your suit on and you pop off to meetings and you go and sit face to face with each people and actually it was just on the cusp of the era where technology allowed us to have remote meetings so uh -huh. like we're doing now uh -huh. um, and so I could so long as I kind of only showed them from here upwards I could actually conduct those meetings in my pajamas and I did on many occasions um, and I think yeah I, I think from that my learning was you know <laughs> you can you it's about putting in the right amount of effort um whilst and presenting and still being able to get on with life and do the things that you need to do but but kind of cutting yourself a bit of a break as well sure. so you know i might my pj i haven't today i might add but i might have my pj bottoms on the bottom and a work shirt on the top and then as soon as i'd finished that meeting because i was working from home pjs went back on and the and the cup of tea came up and <laughs> But I could still, I could still work. I could still deliver what I needed to, which I think was emotionally and mentally a, a, an important part of that process. So I wasn't ill, right. um, which again, some people need to kind of curl up and recover. I personally found finding ways of allowing myself to be as normal as possible sure. in that circumstance really worked for me. Yeah. Um, so I carried on and I worked and I did those things um, and I just after I, I'd gone back to work one of the things that became apparent to me while I was off was that whilst I really liked my job and I think I can qualify that by saying I really liked the people that I worked with mm. um, I didn't particularly like the job as such because wow. there's nothing actively rewarding unless you are very kind of monetarily motivated there's nothing massively rewarding about selling to law firms but you get to meet nice people and you get to work with nice people and I realized that um, I was probably more people motivated wow. um, in my role than I was financially motivated because you know 
you think about people sales people sell because they want to hit those commission checks and make loads of money and you know that's all fabulous but actually it, I, I came to realize that it was the people thing that was important uh -huh. um so my boss who was fabulous david if you're watching um <laughs> gave me time off paid time off i might add during um work to allow me to retrain on the understanding that i didn't then leave and go off and do what I was retraining for um, and so I retrained as a counsellor um, which was fab and really rewarding um, and I started a little business um, outside of my day job so I kept the day job um, I started a business outside of my day job and in the evenings and at weekends ran a counselling business for about three years um, which was fab actually yeah. and, and kind of ticked all those human boxes if that makes sense it, it's a you know i would spend all day um either in the car or at home in meetings talking to people but not really talking to them right if if, if you know what i mean by that kind of having a conversation selling something but you're not really talking no you know not know them you're talking about the product that you're trying to sell yeah. rather than yeah having a conversation yeah and and part of the skill of selling is to kind of make people like you but at the end of the day it's a very superficial process so the counseling business allowed me to do something much more personal um and and allowed me to uh use that side of my of my personality um, and that and that worked really well for me and I enjoyed that and I think you know the process of counselling probably helped me a little bit with the stuff that I've been through Sure. because when you train as a counsellor they use you and the people in your cohort as their subjects so right. they, they they kind of pick you apart in the nicest possible way um, so you learn a lot about yourself going through that process as well so I guess that's another thing I would say along the journey which is count the counselling process was really interesting I didn't go to counselling because of my illness but I ended up involved in counselling and realised what an incredibly useful and therapeutic process that can be so sure. we're not good at that in the UK particularly you know in America, yeah. drop of a hat, don't feel great, we go to counselling, we talk, they talk about those things and we don't hear and I think maybe more people should sure. um, and, and certainly investigate it. So that was kind of about number one, I run the counselling business, um, but life and that now nearly 20 year old daughter and, and, and all of those things meant that, you know, you go, you get kind of sucked back into the daily grind as it were uh-huh yeah um which it did and and as i say very lucky like the people that i worked with changed jobs a few times as you do um and fast forward to eight years after my initial surgery um i'd been going back every year to have scans and all of those things that you do oh. um and then five years so basically they started my scans uh, about two years after I'd had my surgery because for that two-year period I was kind of actively in treatment if you like and then they started me off on an annual scan um, kind of regime and after those five years it was seven nearly eight years after my surgery um, on the yes on the sixth year um, they'd already said that they would continue to recall me because every geography is different but where I live um, you don't start your scheduled mammograms um, until you're 50 so okay. that's, when, that's when they kick in here and I, I know it's different around the country but I think 50 is a fairly common kind of benchmark and I was only 47 uh, 40 what am I now 47 45 at the time mm. when I finished those five-year scans and they said well we'll carry on we'll just keep doing them until you're 50 and I'm like great and anyway they didn't call me back they didn't write to me and I thought well that's a little strange they might just be running late and they still didn't call me back I was meant to go for a scan in the kind of July August mm. and by the time it got to Christmas time that year and I got a bit of downtime I thought 
I'll just nudge them and ring. So I rang them up and said, you haven't called me in for my follow-up scan. And they said, oh, it does say on your file to call you in. We'll go and speak to the consultant and find out why. So they went to speak to the consultant and they said, oh, no, he decided not to call you. But as you've rung, you can come, come in and see us. And I'm kind of glad I did because that scan led to them finding a cluster of new small lumps. Oh, gosh. Okay. Same side. Yeah, same side. Um, and again, I suppose if I'm taking something out of that, don't wait for them. You know, sure. if you're, you're meant to have an appointment and they don't write to you or they don't ring you or they cancel it because somebody's ill or anything else. Just make sure you go. Um, I'm historically not great at going to the doctors. I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm not the person that turns up at the doctors at the site is sniffle, but go. And particularly if you've had a previous scare for something or you, you've got some form of susceptibility or the hereditary family gene or any of those things, just go. Sure. Because I'm a testament to the fact that finding these things relatively early is, is the absolute best news that you can possibly get so they found a whole cluster of little lumps same side as before um and so this time i would say 45 at that point this time um the option on the right side which was a side that i'd had done before was was a, a full mastectomy and i took the view that if we're doing one we might as well do two right. we might as well do them both because clearly there's an issue here. There's, a, there's clearly a susceptibility of some sort. Um, no breast cancer in my family. I don't smoke. I never have. Um, relatively kind of fit and healthy. Eat reasonably well. Don't drink too much. Can't sun worship. I'm ginger. Uh, so all of the things that you're not supposed to do. Um, I, generally, I don't, don't get me wrong, I like your glass of Prosecco here and there, but, but generally speaking, lead a reasonably kind of clean lifestyle. Sure. Um, and I thought, actually, have them both, let's just get the job done. Um, That's a very brave decision. Yeah, it must have been quite scary. It must have been, well, I can't even begin to imagine. It must, the first diagnosis must have been scary and upsetting. Not that, and those words don't feel like they're powerful enough words. Um, but then to have more, and, and also, I must imagine you must have been feeling a little bit angry that you'd been essentially not forgotten because he, the consultant made the decision, didn't he? But, you know, the decision actually wouldn't have benefited you. And, um, no. I know they're all just trying to do their best, but that must have been a really tough time for you. I, I think that, um, and you're absolutely right. I think the, when, whenever, I think when you get a diagnosis like that, and you know, I keep saying everyone's different and they are, and everyone responds to these things differently. But for me, um, you are angry. I think there's an element of, I'm 37 and I don't smoke and, and I don't do any of the things that I'm really technically not supposed to. Again, as I say, your glass of prosecco and a bit of kind of late night dancing with the girls. But you know, <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing that, that, that most of us don't do. Um, and no family history. And you think, wow, that's a bit steep. And actually, I had a nine-year-old daughter, but had I not had children at 37, which is quite common these days. Mm -hmm. You know, I had my daughter when I was 27. So relatively young in today's terms for a working professional type person i know yeah. everybody has children at different ages but if you're in that kind of corporate world it's very common not to have children into your 30s my sister didn't have her daughter she was 36 had that been me i wouldn't have any children right yeah. um and that's, you know, that, that was um, a, re a difficult thing to swallow. But I kind of took the attitude, you know, I can be angry about this. I can be sad about this. I can be miserable. I can retreat. I can do all of those things. But the only person that actually really suffers if I do that is me. Um, they talk a lot about positive mental attitude when these things happen. And I think the first time 
somebody says that you probably want to write it on a piece of paper screw to people and throw it at them um, <laughs> but the reality is that it does make a difference and I, and I don't know if it makes a difference necessarily to your survival rate but it certainly makes a difference to how you experience the journey right you know yeah. that that's why you put your work shirt on the top half and your pajamas on the bottom and you're happy you meet and you smile and then you turn it off and if you want to you go to sleep on the sofa for three hours and that's and and you kind of have to do what you what you need to do to get through but actually on a day-to-day -day basis if you choose and it is a choice if you choose not to let it make you miserable then actually you do lead a relatively normal life whilst you're going through that process and I make that choice sound easy and, for, and, and it's not easy for everybody. But with me, it was, I need to work. I need to look after my daughter. I think that was also important. You have to show, you know, if, you, if you're nothing but, but, oh, woe is me, that's all your child sees. Right, yeah. And that yeah. makes it very difficult for them. In fact, and you'll probably like this story. I went to... Um, after I'd had my first surgery about two weeks after that it was um, sports day at primary school and we lived very close to school so I said to Ella daughter's Ella um hi Ella you watching um she's in Morocco at the moment hi Ella oh, lovely. I know six, for six months teaching English to adults oh, wow. for a charity oh. called ISEC in Morocco um so I went up to the to the uh, went up to sports day and I sat and watched and I said to her before I went I said look I might not stay for a long time because you know mummy's just had an operation and stuff but I will come for a little while and come and watch you anyway I went up and watched and I didn't stay all day you know I stayed for about an hour or so and then I kind of toddled off home anyway when she got in I said oh did you you know did your your house win and all of those things and she said yes we did she said but I'm quite cross with you mummy I'm like okay why I said I came I said I would come she went yes she said but you know I've been a little bit sad about you being poorly I went yes and she went well my friends say that you look absolutely fine she said so now they think I'm a big baby she said could you not try to look a little bit sicker <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was absolutely priceless because of course you kind of you do you think you're doing the right things so you put your best you know, kind of your best smile on and you, your clothes on and you know and you sit and you talk to everyone and you, can, you look as normal as you can be and she's like now you've made me out to be a real baby because i said you were really poorly and you're not are you I'm like, okay um yeah so i think keeping it together as it were i didn't actually consciously have to do that that was just kind of my way right but i think that you, you know, subconsciously, even if you're not aware of it, you just make a choice. And I know that sounds really clinical and maybe hard on people who find it difficult, but you make a choice. Like you do with everything in life, you can be sad and, and you know, l allow it to make you unhappy or you can be as happy as you can be under the circumstances. Sure, sure. And that's, and that's, that's kind of my take on it, I think. So, Roll forward to the second time, took the decision to have a double mastectomy. Um, and I thought, while I'm on the table, because I've been on the table a few times now, while I'm on the table, let's just do it all and do a reconstruction, do a rebuild at the same time. So um, to have a double mastectomy and to have a rebuild, and the sort of rebuild they did with me was they cut a section of my stomach out. And um, okay. I don't know how gory you want me to get in this scenario, but the stuff that they do is amazing. So they basically take your stomach out, take a second of your stomach out, chop it in half, pop it inside. So they've emptied out the, the, the kind of breast cavity, pop it inside, and then do microsurgery to join all the tiny little capillaries and everything up. So the wow. light the live kind of flesh and skin from your stomach is then joined up to all the blood vessels and things from where they've chopped everything out. Wow, that's incredible. It's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. That surgery standardly is meant to take about 12 hours. Um, we took nearly 19, about 18 and a half, 19 hours because of various different complications. And also because I'd had surgery once before on the right hand side and radiotherapy. So I've got quite a lot of scar tissue and things that they had to deal with. Mm. Um, eight drains, IV drip, intravenous antibiotics, an infection, and 14 days in hospital. Oh, gosh. 
um, so, so significantly bigger surgery than the first time um, yeah. and the kind of complications and the infection um, added to that obviously um, so needless to say I was off work for a little while <laughs> after that cool. one um, and I'm very lucky I live very centrally in a beautiful town called Stamford um, which means that I can literally walk out of my front door and directly opposite we have a fabulous coffee shop and directly underneath we have a hairdresser's and then another fabulous coffee shop to that side so I could make little jaunts out to go and have cups of tea and kind of see people be Fantastic. not be isolated because I think that's another problem when people are ill you become isolated and then it's very easy I think to become quite introverted and insular and and overly aware of your circumstances whereas if you can get out see things all people come and see you which is obviously which is great um so while i was off i'd had this idea for my app um some years before actually while i was kind of in the grown-up job as it were um and whilst i was off i thought you know what I think actually now's a good time let's see what we can do with this let's use this space uh -huh. that, that this illness has created um, to do something with it to do something different um, during my one of my my kind of corporate jobs I call them my grown-up jobs um, during one of those um, I'd worked with a company uh, based in Cambridge and developed a roller coaster app um, for a lot of them. Very, very cool, actually. Back in the days of, I don't know if you've ever heard of Google Cardboard, they were like kind of like a box of uh, almost looked like glasses, a box, and you put your phone in the front. They're the kind yeah. of precursor to the big, fabulous Samsung VR headsets that we have now. Mm. Um, and it was an app made with Google Cardboard. Um, and you popped the phone in the front and you felt like you were really on a roller coaster and we did kind of lots of yeah it was really cool and really good fun and lots of messaging um, for the law firm and everything and we released it at a at a beer festival so the more beer people drank the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you can see where I'm going with that can't you by the end of the night you've got some really tipsy people wearing these headsets kind of weaving all over the place whilst they were on this roller coaster Amazing. Um, yeah which was fun and i really enjoyed that process i'm quite a creative person i like making stuff uh -huh. um, and i always describe the things i make for people as things that are likely to make them smile or maybe make them cry but then they will put them in a cupboard because they might not want them on display because they might not be good enough but there's lots of love Lots of love gone into those things. And um, so I enjoyed that creative process, that app process. And I'd had this idea for a safety app, for a personal safety app a few years before. Um, and while I was off, I thought, right, well, I know a good development house and people that I've worked with before, so I can at least run the idea by them. Uh -huh. um, and that boss, David, um, from when I had my first cancer bout, I worked with him for seven years. They work in the technology sector, so I basically wrote the brief up and sent it to him, um, and said, "What do you think? Am I crazy, or you know, is this a viable product? What you know, what, what would you do with this?" Um, and I think that was really important as well, actually, just for the sake of saying it. It's very difficult when you have something new because you don't know who to share with. Sure. You need honest opinions. Family are fine, but most of them will just tell you everything's great because they want to be supportive um, uh -huh. and not necessarily the most objective. So finding somebody who wants to support you and, and, and is of a similar mindset to yourself, so would like to see you do well, but is removed enough that if it's rubbish, or you're wasting your time, we'll tell you, or we'll give you some or constructive criticism was really important to that process. Because I genuinely think that had I not sent that off to him, it probably wouldn't be a live product now. Right. Because I would second guess myself constantly. Uh -huh. going, well, I think it's great, but of course I think it's great because I developed it. But then is it really, I'm not sure because I'm not 
I, I don't have maybe the right experience or maybe the right self-belief or I'm not prepared to take the risk and the financial risk of doing something like that just on my own feelings. Sure. But as soon as you send an idea like that out to a commercial organisation, you always have the risk that that organisation is going to pick up and run with it themselves if they think it's a really good idea. Of course, yeah, yeah, there's a risk involved. Mm. There is, and I had that happen to me before in a in an earlier life um, with something, with an idea, and you, you kind of, not everybody is completely trustworthy. So finding that kind of mentor, that kind of business mentor type person was really useful. And I popped the spec out to David and he's like, he came to see me um, and uh, started giving me feedback and about five minutes in went, if you want some money, by the way, I can, you know, me and my pal, who also know, are, are, are up for some of that. And I'm like, oh, okay. So you actually must really like it. Yeah, like, wow. Nice. He didn't actually end up giving me any money. It's a long story. But, <laughs> but <laughs> and, I, and the offer was genuine. But what it did was it kind of lit a bit of a fire. And I went, okay, come on. Come on, Sarah, do it. it, it you know, if you don't do it, you'll never know. And well these things you know people have ideas all the time yeah you know, one of the things I find because I have had a couple over the years and done a couple of different things people tell you their ideas say oh, I have this really great idea for this or this really great idea for that and most people are, most is maybe unfair but an awful lot of people have those thoughts and those ideas and they have these wonderful moments of excitement and then they just forget or they just don't have the self-belief or they just go but actually I need to do the nine to five or whatever it is and they put them to one side and and yeah. don't take that risk and I think that if something is is good enough there's always a way even if it's part-time alongside the day job for a sure. while or whatever it might be but there's nothing quite so so exciting i think as working on something of your own you'll know the yeah. whole big <laughs> exactly exactly i think you know? that's a, that's a really important point actually um I don't, have you heard of the book the um the pursuit of happiness yes there's i haven't actually read that but i have read a book called the happiness of pursuit which is sort of a funny spin on the title and the guy is talking about this particular guy he he his challenge was to visit every um every country in the world but he talks wow. about other people's challenges and that without going into it too much but having a goal or a, a, a challenge or something to be working towards a hobby it is really valuable for your for your own mental health you know um because we kind of swing between either being bored or being out of our comfort zone and if you can be somewhere in the middle you know it's good to get out of your comfort zone but if you you know challenging yourself but without scaring the hell out of yourself kind of thing I guess and I'm um, going back to what you're saying about so many people do just let their amazing ideas waft away you know because they're too bogged down in the nine to five and the daily grind and actually I, I, be I believe what you said there is a way you know if you think about all the people you know and who they know if you start asking around in in a way so is that you feel safe as not to lose your idea to a competitor but I'm sure that you can find a way if you're if you're determined enough that um, and, people and pe yeah people are natural problem solvers that's that's you know w without even realizing it we solve problems every day every uh, within every hour there's always a challenge even if it's how do I turn the kettle off whilst putting this on and doing that, we we multitask. We 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 are built that way. That's the way our brains work. And people come up with really interesting, really good things, and you just think that's quite cool. Actually, I I would use that. I would buy that. I would give that to my friend. I would whatever it might be, whatever that idea is, and you know a lot a lot of people making little changes and doing little things that are good for the world make a big difference and on the being out of your comfort zone somebody once said to me that every day you should do something that scares you um and for the years that my daughter lived here I said I do I wake Ella every morning I wake my daughter up that scares me a little bit that's enough for the day I've done I've done my task <sighs> but you know you, you should I think getting out of your comfort zone a little bit i think it's a 
it's a practice thing you know if you if you're not somebody that's not good with that do it a little bit and the counselor in me would say have a little go come back to a place of safety have another little go and you'll find that as you learn and you stretch yourself you'll become more comfortable being uncomfortable sure. and I think that as a phrase probably helped me quite a lot during my periods of illness as well because you're clearly uncomfortable in there you just have to get used to it and get get good at being in in that situation and um, so basically I had some time off um, and I set about creating the app um, I did find a couple of investors um, to work with me because these things aren't cheap um, not David as it happens um, but uh, yeah we have uh, the dice app dice as in little square thing with numbers on it uh -huh. um, and and it came about as dice because ice which is ICE so in case of emergency contacts I heard about um, yeah and and basically what the app allows you to do is set up three ice contacts emergency contacts um and then allows you to go off wherever you might be so you could be in a work environment or with this version yeah that would kind of let me so be a networking socially type work environment or on holiday or just out on a friday night with your friends or going on an online date or any of those scenarios and the app allows you to check in with your in case of emergency contact so it creates automatic emails or text depending on what activity you're performing um that it sends out to these people for you and you can check in by yourself so just with a little one tap button that says i'm here so right. people know you're safe um and it will capture your location the time the date um, on that little check-in it allows you to send an SOS message so I'm in trouble trouble and I'm and again date time whatever and it'll, it'll both text and email people in that scenario but the other thing that it does which is the kind of unique really unique part of the product is it allows you to check in with other people so we're currently running a program where we're trying to roll the app out to students um, for free so uh particularly thinking about freshers but it could be any student right. um because the app allows you to check in with somebody else okay. so you're out and you're with a bunch of friends and another bunch of people come over and go oh we're going on to you know we're all students who are at the same uni whatever we're going on to this club do you want to join us your mates don't want to go but you, excuse me but you do so mm. you're about to go off with a bunch of people that you don't know right and you think that you know them because they go to your uni and and there's an element of kind of camaraderie there but you don't you don't know those people you don't know anything about those people so we have a, a mechanism of allowing you to check in with another person similarly if you're on an online date so you've met somebody on i don't know sure i know that match um and you've been chatting online and you go off to meet them for dinner now in the old you know you might say to a friend well look i'll text you at 10 30 um uh -huh. to know i'm okay but in this scenario if you're using that product and or if you're using dice and or they they're using dice you check in it will send their contact information and and a selfie of the two of you and your date and your location and everything else back to your eyes contacts so they know that you're okay and we've not built it as a real-time tracker because we don't want to put people off using it it's more for kind of evidentiary purposes so if anything bad did happen to you we know you were in this place at this time with this person right you're out and you meet somebody and you say yeah cool well i'll come you know we'll come on here i just need to check in and they go well no i'm not doing that well then you go well why would I want to leave here with somebody who isn't prepared to do that with me? So it's, sure. it has an element of deterrent and we're really lucky. We've got a, a major police force um, who we're working with and actually I've got a big presentation with them next week. I've got to go and stand up in front of a chief constable and a whole bunch of policemen. Wow. Um, slightly nervous. Um, mm. And talk about, I don't, give me 50 lawyers or 100 lawyers any day, but 25 policemen, I'm not sure about that. Oh. Um, <laughs> so fine 
Well, and they're looking at using it with people in their uh, in their vulnerable people's unit. So um, domestic violence, forced marriage, that kind of thing. Mm. So we'll need, we'll need to make some little tweaks to the product, I think, to make it work for them. Um, but that's great because what a great thing to be able to do um, and to be able to be helpful with that. And we're talking to an airline um, who are potentially interested in maybe getting the product out to their clients when they go on holiday. But but the big push for us as a new business, because we've built the product and the product is there and ready to go, um, but obviously we're, we're still new, we're still a fledgling businesses. We're running a campaign on Chuffed, and I don't know if you've heard of Chuffed, but it's a, a social causes crowdfunding okay. platform. Right, no, I haven't. But yeah. Have you not? They do great work, actually. I did a small contract with them this year. I did a little three-month contract with them. Um, but they do great things. So they have all sorts of fabulous causes on there. People raising money to do good things, basically. Awesome. Um, yeah, they're really cool. I think you'd like them, actually. I think you should check them out. And you never know, there might be an inter interview in that for you because yeah. there's some good people working there. Um so uh, and knowing a little bit about the background story as to how it was created that that might work for you actually but they um yeah so we've, we've launched a campaign on there to help us raise money to reach those students because whilst i'm really happy to give the app away for free to the students um, what normally happens with the app is you buy it you download it for free and after you've used it a certain amount of time to ask you to pay for it so right, any, okay. it's only one ninety nine. it's only a little amount of money but i don't want to make the students pay for it because i know what students are like one ninety nine is is a is a beer or a couple of shots in a club on the thursday night and i know what they'll do they'll say well i'm not having it unless it's free sure so well, i'm happy to to forego any revenue from the from the app to give it to the students so you know be, i want to do a good thing my daughter's a student she before she went off to morocco she was at edinburgh uni um for a year and she's going back to Edinburgh next year um, and the stats on crime are, in the student community are horrific uh, mm. absolutely terrible so well over 40 percent of female students and over 25 percent of male students have had some form of been involved in some form of assault it, it, it's mm. like that's terrible that's nearly half of the female student population and over a quarter of the male student population Wow. Um, and those stats are much much higher in the student community than they are in the general uh, in, in uh, you know in society as a whole because students are by the nature of the way that they tend to live more at risk you know wow. they're, they're away in new cities in places that they don't know with people that they don't know they tend to party a little bit perhaps i don't sure. want to cast versions but you know <laughs> um and and they're in environments that are not familiar to them and for a lot of them it is their first time living away from home so irrespective of what they might think and they wouldn't thank me for saying it but they're not as streetwise as they might think they are of course no, no. so they're they're a really at risk community um and so we want to get the app out to them. We don't want them to have to pay for it. That's all fine. I have control over that. But of course, it costs money to reach them. There's no free service that says, let me put in touch, you in touch with all of these students and give you this app for free. Right. People, people charge it. So it costs us money to give them a product for free. And because we're a new business, we don't have that money particularly, or at least we don't have all of the money that we need to be able to reach as you know we want to reach as many students as possible so sure. we're running a, a, a crowd funder to raise money to help us get that app out to as many students as we possibly can so yeah. that hopefully we can have a bit of an impact on those safety stats and if nothing else give them a tool that acts as a deterrent and makes maybe them a little bit more aware of their choices sure sure yeah, that's brilliant. So if I wanted to um, help you get the message to those students, that's really what you're crowdfunding for, isn't it? The, yes. the ability to reach the students in the first place. The students get the, the DICE app for free, but you need yeah. to, they need to know that it exists. Um, yeah. so it's the marketing side of things that you need help with. So it's Chuffed, the name. I'll, I'm sure you'll send me a link and then I can share I'll it. Send, 
Yeah, I'll send you a link. It's on Chuffed and the, the campaign is simply called Keep Our Students Safe. So nice and easy to remember. Right. So if you search Chuffed for Keep Our Students Safe, that's where it'll be. Um, yeah, and what we're doing is we're, we're trying to raise money to allow us to do as much marketing out to that student community as we possibly can. So the NUS, the National Union of Students, do things like bi month, uh, uh, um, fortnightly newsletters. Okay. So to all of the students that have signed up to the student union card, which most of them do, because then they get discounts on pizzas and stuff, and they can go to the student union bar and all the things that we know they're going to want to do. Uh -huh. um, they email their student community with vouchers and promotions and ideas. So that's a really good way to reach the students, to send them a link to the app and a little code that says, this is the free download code. You're a student, away you go. You can have the app for free. But of course, the NUS charge you to advertise to, to, to be included in those newsletters. Okay. So, um, and actually to reach, you know, to reach as many students, Student, to reach to reach all of those students on a on a kind of you need to do reach them three or four times you need to send a regular message so they see the product not just as a one off mm. it's going to cost us the best part of probably twelve to fifteen thousand pounds right. yeah yeah um, and put a lot of money into the app as it is so at some point in time you they need to reach yeah. Them. And actually, as I say, this isn't this isn't about building revenue. It's about doing a good thing. On the flip side, of course, if we do end up with a lot of students using the product, one thing that students and younger people are really good at is feedback. So what we will as a business get out of that, I'm sure, is a lot of feedback through the app store on we like this, but we don't like that. Or we found a bug here or whatever. Um, it, we obviously we hope there aren't any bugs, but you know what I mean. So I huh. think having an active user community you know there are of course benefits to us as a business to me as a business owner because i get some feedback on the app and i get to improve the product as well so i get a win out of it of course um but i you know i also get to do a good thing which is you know this that student safety is really prominent in the news at the moment there's been on sky news they've been on there's been stuff going on 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 the bbc um nadia and Kay from loose women if you they, they've just released a, a book on student safety there's all sorts of stuff going on in the media at the moment um and, and so to be able to contribute to that and actually give them something practical for free that they can download and have on their phones. Because, you know, if you, if you look at any kind of standard young-ish person's phone apps, it's, you know, yeah. it's, their, it's their native place. They're less likely to read a book about student safety than they are to download and use an app. Sure, sure. So we, we just, yeah, want to reach as many people as we can. Fantastic. That's awesome. I love the fact that, you know, you, you've gone through these hardships of your, your own and the, your daughter being a massive influence in your life, obviously, um, and then using that time when you were poorly to um, the second time round um, to put your time to good use and, and create such an amazing app that's going to help so many people, not only obviously the students, but the other people that can um, pay for it. Um, it's going to be amazing it's such a it's so important because we are out and about all the time and and to be able to check in with people and say where we're going is um is brilliant so i, I think that's fantastic app. thank you i mean the the just as a you know ignoring the student community just for a second two out of ten predators find their targets online so yeah. Yeah, I know, which is actually quite a scary number. So that's that's include if you think about that, that being two out of ten, that includes the people that are just walking down the street and like bash you on the back of the head. We can't help you with those. We, that's not something that we can get involved in. But and people who are out in pubs and clubs and and all of those other things. But actually, convicted criminals that go back online and and use that online dating space in particular to mm. certain people that they consider to be vulnerable um, when you're on holiday 
you know, the first time I know if the product had been in existence, the first time Ella went off to Ibiza or Magaluf or all the terrible places, Marbella, the places that they all go as, as big groups of girls on holiday when she went off with a, like a sixth form friends. You, as a parent, you'd be going, okay, but you use this app and you check in with me every day. Yeah. I want to know. I want to know that you're okay. So you're going to send me a little check-in. And when you're out meeting people, if I don't get at least half a dozen check-ins of you with that, with somebody new, by the way, when you're out, I know you're not using it because you're meeting people. And the deal is that when somebody, when you check in with somebody new, all that information is encrypted. So as a parent receiving that, I can't open it and go, oh, she was with this person at this time on this day. But if something happens to her, I can give that information to the police, which, which is what the police are really interested in because then they have a sealed kind of um, evidentiary uh, envelope, if you like, that says this is untampered with and I know this is real. Um, wow. As a parent, I can't, you know, if you go out on a Saturday night and, and meet somebody, I can't go and knock on their door and say, oh, you know, my daughter came back upset, what did you do? That's, that's not my place. But the app's job is to capture the information to allow the authorities to deal with something if something should happen. And as you say, you know, there's huge pockets of the community that that applies to. So hopefully we can do a, a good thing. That's actually a really important point to make about the app then, because that's a really big selling point, in my opinion, that, you know, for the students especially. And, and you know, if you are going on dates and you don't necessarily want the other person to no or whoever to know um that your uh was it three ice contacts that you've got yeah. they don't actually know where you are they just know that you're you're checking in and that you're safe kind of thing yeah. and Absolutely. that's brilliant isn't it that's really good and then you can hand that over if anything you, if you if you have to um so that's a massive uh selling point in my opinion really thank you the, the reason that we did it that way was because in order to gather information and we have a very in the social setting we have a very fun little way of capturing that other person's information you have to download the app and try it but it's called doing the stag so we get people to like do the stag hands when okay. we take a photo because if you get somebody to do the stag if you're taking a photo of them so they pull this and actually you can get their palm prints off so the police can retrieve their palm prints from that photograph ah wow we, which is why we had to encrypt that information so carefully because what we're saying is you're out on a date with somebody we do a little check-in we take their phone number we send them a little funny phrase so you know they've given you their actual phone number because it could have been any phone number that they give you so you've got their actual phone number um they do the stag so they've had their funny phrase so you've made them giggle already so you've kind of you relaxed you do the stag you do a selfie because again if you're out with somebody and you're not prepared to stand next to them and take a photograph you don't feel comfortable well then you probably shouldn't be with that person anyway or be out with that person so mm -hmm. Funny phrase, stag, selfie. So when, when, if it should be needed by the police, they know the date, the time, the location. We've got this, so they can get that if they need it. And they've got a selfie of you with that person. So they know you were definitely with them. They definitely know who they are. And they've got the date, the time and the location of that in interaction all wrapped up, which as I say, is why the police like the idea so much because that gives them a huge amount of information. If the other person is using the app already, when you get the app, you get the opportunity to upload your own palm prints. So you can take a picture of both of your palm prints. If the other person's using the app, they don't have to do the stag, it just swaps that information. Oh, okay. Which is really handy and really easy. The stag's quite funny. When we, when we were up in Edinburgh, I was up with my daughter and her, actually ex-boyfriend but anyway up with her boyfriend and they were they were testing this out and he was you know a nice good looking young lad and he stood in the bar with her with her phone and he's doing this and this table of girls came over she went, what have you got him doing she said, he's doing the stag what's the stag well it's this and they explained she's like right okay you stag so we have all these people in the bar doing this because actually in a social setting it's quite a relaxed funny kind of thing to do and you look a bit daft doing it which kind of makes it makes it easy uh -huh. makes it a, a yeah makes it a fun way of capturing somebody's information um 
and it just means that you know that that then is there as a um just as a record you know it's just kind of like somebody's kind of got your back just in case um so yeah that's that's kind of how the, that's what the what the product's for it's brilliant I mean, for me the it works twofold it's obviously capturing this information so if the worst could happen obviously it, that person can be traced um but also it's a massive deterrent right up at the start yeah. mass that's an amazing selling point you know so uh, I you know I really do wish you the best of luck with that Sarah it sounds amazing and um, I know you've got your presentation coming up so I hope that goes really well as well Um, but yeah thank you so much for joining us I've really enjoyed talking to you and it sounds like an amazing project I'll share links in the um, YouTube description but if you like this video please do hit the like and subscribe button and you'll get notified and the little bell and you'll get notifications when new uh, videos are uploaded you can follow us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter if you search for at the glad movement you'll be able to find us and we've started doing a few lives on facebook so it's worth following along on facebook as well um yeah and if you've got a story that you'd like to share please do get in touch it doesn't matter if it's a story that's similar to someone else's because i do truly believe that your story and your voice really can help someone when they're in a difficult situation so please do get in touch i'd love to hear from you thanks for tuning in and we'll see you in another episode many thanks